is perhaps one of the most well-known epidemiologists, clinicians, and endocrinologists in Latin America. And he has been involved with multiple guidelines. He also worked with the World Health Organization. Uh, he has been the leader from the Latin American Diabetes Association for many years. So welcome, Pablo. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Guillermo. The next, the, the other speaker there is Kitan Dataria. He's a very close friend of mine. He's perhaps the most productive young faculty that I've met. He's not young anymore, but he's full professor now. Uh, he's at the UK. And, and he has been the, the lead author for most of the inpatient, everything related to diabetes in the hospital, everything related to diabetes in the, in the hospital setting. In addition, he works with, very, very close with all of the guidelines in the UK. Uh, welcome, Kitan. And Thanks, I have Guillermo. the pleasure to, to write many, several papers with him, and we are reviewing the DK guidelines for the American Diabetes Association. So he's just so prolific and so, so productive. And, and with me, uh, uh, we're going to have um, uh, Anup Misra, that we just presented the previous lectures and is very well known to all of you. Um, I don't know if you would like to introduce you to, yeah. to the two speakers. Well, I'm, I'm a clinician. Um, uh, my research interest is in diabetes metabolic syndrome and we, have, uh, we were the first one from India to make uh, guidelines as far as obesity is concerned. And I have been uh, part of uh, making several guidelines on the national level, Indian Council of Medical Research and Ministry of Health. Thank you. Yeah, so, so Anu, we have been listening to many lectures during the last couple of days here about guidelines, recommendations from the ADA, the American College, the UK. I mean, do we really need so many of these guidelines? I mean, there are so many guidelines around. The, do you have any in particular that you, you, you follow, you think is more real down to earth, or they're all the same? Thank you. I think this is a very important uh, meeting and uh, your question is very pertinent. Um, so let's trace back the fol following the guideline as far as India is concerned for the last 30 years. So if you look at 1990 to 2000, uh, India did not have any sort of guideline. And so everybody was looking forward to ADA guidelines, that was the only guideline at that point, point of time. Uh, and... Uh, what? Don't disturb that. Who is disturbing? You, know, that, you just sit quiet, okay? Let this lady go. You don't go. You just sit quiet. Don't you worry, uh, Peter and Pablo. Yeah. Sit quiet. Hello? So, um, the scene somewhat changed from 2000 to 2010. We, we got a little uh, we, entertainment here. And we're having a two, one minute pause. Sorry, sorry for that. No, yeah, let, let that be. <laughs> Uh, okay, sorry, sorry about that. So from 2000 onwards, uh, there was a greater realization because of multiple research studies in India that, uh, you know, maybe diabetes in India is a little different, our body composition is a little different, uh, and so on. So the people started to look inwards towards our own data and making some guidelines. At this time, uh, Indian the agencies, health agencies, Indian Council of Medical Research also uh, started making guidelines for uh, diabetes and some guidelines on made for obesity. So the, 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 the uh, following of some Indian guidelines started from 2010 onwards. But if you look at the overall perspective and from general 
pr practitioner's perspective, it is the ADA guideline which are still being followed by most of the people. And even when an Indian researcher speaks about his research, there is always at the back of mind ADA guidelines. Somewhere there are other guidelines also. <coughs> and people are realizing about the NICE guidelines, the IDF, IDF guideline, and some to some extent Canadian and Australian guidelines also. But largely ADA and uh, we are also, we are, as far as obesity is concerned, we are following our own guidelines at this point of time. So, so Keaton, they, they, today we, we review the NICE guidelines that recommend that they met four minutes GLT-2s and they're ignoring the GLP-1, they're ignoring other drugs. Uh, do you have to, would you like to comment about the UK guidelines regarding to diabetes care? Okay, so the difference is that, that yes, you're absolutely right. Thanks, Guillermo. So what's happened is that the way that NICE works is that it, it uses uh, the published data, but in addition, it uses uh, health, health, sorry, health economic analyses. And so what they did for this update of uh, the NICE NG28 that was published in March of this year is that they uh, looked at the health economic analysis based for the GLP-1 analogs, and um, they decided that it was, they were not cost-effective to use. They ignored the cardiovascular benefits and the weight and all the other things that we know about. But the problem was that the analysis that, the, that NICE did was unfortunately flawed. We know that because when the, it's all published in the public data. So, for example, they assumed that subcutaneous semaglutide was used daily. And of course, we know that that's wrong. So the, the numbers that they plugged in to their health economic calculator was incorrect. So there's been a huge amount of pushback to NICE. Now, every specialist diabetes doctor that I speak to says, NICE is great. It's very nice. It's, you know, it does a good job. But actually, they've got it wrong. And so we're going to continue using GLP-1 analogs because of the cardiovascular benefit that we know is out there. We, we are bound almost, we're not bound, but that NICE is almost uh, law for us. So we have to try and follow it as much as we can. But we are allowed to, because they're guidelines, they're not tram lines. So we are allowed to work outside, spe especially, you know, diabetes specialists. The problem comes when general practitioners are looking for advice and what to do. And they see NICE says, don't use GLP-1s. And so they'll say, uh, we won't want to use them. So we, we have to then... Uh, overcome that mistake that NICE has made. The other issue that you mentioned there is obviously moving the SGLT2s up to co-first line with metformin and those people who have got established cardiac or heart failure, uh, so cardiac disease or heart failure or CKD, uh, or in those people who've got high cardiovascular risk. And so they deem high cardiovascular risk to those people who plug into a risk calculator, which some of you may have heard of called the QRISC3 calculator, so if your risk is above three, uh, sorry, above ten percent, then you are deemed to be at high risk, and you'd go on to uh, then you'd go on to a SGLT2 straight away. I think that th that aspect of nice in in moving the SGLT2s up uh, to co first line with metformin is probably a good thing, but their lack of inclusion of GLP1 is definitely a bad thing. Yeah, we, we're coming back to you, Keaton, but now, Pablo, I know. You you led the American, the Latin American Diabetes Association guidelines, and I'm, I heard that you guys are working on the new guidelines coming up. Can you tell us what is your perspective of Latin America relating to cost, new drugs, and what are you guys going to recommend? Thank you, Guillermo, and uh, thank you for uh, letting me join you uh, in this very interesting uh, discussion. Um, we in Latin America, as I suppose uh, in many other uh, parts of the world, we are worried about the fact that uh, almost 80% uh, or more of the type 2 uh, people with uh, type 2 diabetes are taken care by uh, GPs. And uh, in, a, in a very uh, difficult uh, condition where they have lots of patients with different uh, pathologies and they have very uh, little time to 
take care of them, like maybe sometimes the visits last uh, like 10 minutes or up to maybe 15 minutes. Uh, in many places with uh, very little resources uh, and uh, the patients uh, have to uh, pay their medicines out of their pockets. And in those conditions, uh, we need a guideline that will tell them what's the most practical and uh, direct way to treat the patients, uh, avoiding too many uh, options based on, on, you know, whether they have a cardiovascular disease, whether they have a, a renal disease, because uh, only, I would, we, we've calculated that no more or even less than 20% of the patients have these complications. So 80% of the patients are not yet with uh, uh, any uh, cardiovascular uh, problem or renal problem in uh, primary care. Therefore, we believe that uh, the guidelines should be very simple at the beginning so that they would, would uh, you know, prescribe what is best for most patients. And then when it doesn't work, then decide how to uh, pers uh, individualize and uh, uh, in that case, maybe uh, decide on, on more expensive drugs. And definitely uh, GLP-1s are expensive, very expensive in our, in our uh, region. So we have left, as in the NICE guidelines, we have left the GLP-1s, the injectables, as a, as a second or third stage. And uh, to start with, we usually recommend metformin uh, more and more combined from the beginning with another oral uh, um, glucose-lowering drug. Uh, the preferred glucose-lowering drug we recommend is uh, DPP-4 because we know that uh, DPP-4 inhibitors, be, uh, because we know that uh, most of those patients are not, do not have a very high risk of uh, cardiovascular disease when the GP sees them for the first time. And if they do a good job lowering blood sugar and controlling the other risk factors, and that is very important, giving statins to all of them, uh, controlling the blood pressure, uh, lifestyle measurements, including uh, stop smoking and all that, we believe that uh, the, the, that would be enough to prevent cardiovascular disease if they are treated early and in a, in a, in a directed way. Uh, and and uh, I, we believe that uh, many choices may create confusion and I would dare say may lead to inertia. Thank you, Pablo. And, and interesting, in the United States, um, if, despite the guidelines recommendation, if you look at the medication utilization, metformin is number one, about 68% of the patients with type 2 diabetes are on metformin. Then second in line, it comes sulfonylurea. And about 28% are on sulfonylurea. So the most common combination is metformin, sulfonylurea, and then it comes insulin. And then down, down, to the insulin is about 25, 26%. It comes DPP-4, about 12, 14%. And, and I guess it would be the same here in India, that, that primary care are going from metformin, sulfonylurea combination and not going through more safe medication. Thank you. Uh, well, this certainly is the scenario in India, but things are changing fast. Uh, so the two things have occurred. One is the um, the the cetagliptin and the vildagliptin both have gone out of patent. So there are 60 to 70 brands of each drug are available and very cheap too. So that is number one. And the second thing is Forsija, Dapagliflozin also went out of patent, and there are number of uh, number of uh, uh, the drugs available with different names, dapagliflozin, is now available in a cheaper, so much cheaper than earlier. So what is happening is, 
while largely rural and semi urban based uh, in, uh, indian practitioners are using sulfonylurea metformin as the first line of therapy and um, maybe sometimes using pyrazone also but increasingly now using uh, dpp4 inhibitor and even aglt2 there are market forces also here if there are 60 companies telling you that this is good then somewhere down the line somebody believes that that is good so lots of market forces and there is a changing behavior and sglt2 inhibitors are rapidly coming up right after metformin as the second line therapy sometimes inappropriately also so uh, but that is the kind of dynamics that we are seeing in indian market so before we open up for discussion here for question and answer from the public uh, the first sglt2 approved in the market by the FDA was canagliflozin. And it was going to go out of patent next year, in 2023, 24. But I just look at this before I started this symposium. And now canagliflozin patent has been extended to 2033. So 10 more years. And you know why? It's because they say I have cardiovascular protection. So for glucose, they will have lost the patent in a couple of years. DAPA will have lost the patent in 2024. But now all of these companies, because of the cardiovascular outcome trial, they're saying, I am cardiovascular protected. Would that be important in the UK, the matter of if they approved or not by the European Agency of Medication? So in terms of patent extension, it may be, because obviously they're, they're, the companies, they're that their main concern is making sure their bottom line and their shareholders get the maximum. I think that we know that other drugs are going to come off patent. So you're right, you know, liraglutide loses its patent, I think, next year. So that will be generic as well. And so there will be cheaper options. And so the question then is, is will the guidelines change dependent on the cost rather than the clinical benefit? So to me, I think that they may do because, you know, the ADA EASD guidance has this big section on where cost is important and it just limits you to sulfonylureas and, and pyoglitazone. But if we've got a DPP-4s, if we've got a, a, a GLP-1 analog which is generic, then they will fall into the cost um, uh, uh, columns and therefore the guidelines may change specifically for that. And I completely agree with Pablo, when you have to pay for your own prescriptions, you want to go for a cheaper option. But if you have an option which has got cardiovascular benefit and renal benefit and so on, then why not use those? And so therefore there may be a rejiggling of the um, order once those drugs become more available. And, and, and let me ask you, let me have before, Paolo, I'm going to give you the microphone now. I can hear myself. I know. Uh, Paolo, <laughs> if, if all the medications, if you know, the American College of Endocrinology have their guidelines and they do not take in consideration cost. They just take in consideration efficacy and safety of the different medications. So that would not apply in Latin America, but I would like you to comment about if medication will not, if cost will not be a factor, should the guidelines will be different or what is your point of view about that? Well, Thank you, Guillermo. In, in, actually, in Colombia, where I live and work, uh, we have uh, global coverage. So the drugs are, I mean, the cost is not an issue for the patient. It's an issue for the government, obviously, but not for the patient. And still, um, we believe that um, GLP-1s are too expensive and that, uh, and, and also uh, patients do not adhere to the GLP-1 for a long time, uh, that's, that's an issue. So we prefer to leave them for the obese people. On the other hand, the availability of metformin with uh, DPP-4 and nowadays also with a GLP-1 in a, in a uh, combination in one uh, single pill makes it uh, better for, from the point of view of adherence. So uh, that has favored these uh, combinations uh, and SUs because of the 
the price is uh, quite similar nowadays, have, come, uh, have become less and less uh, used. Uh, we had the same uh, situation as in India, but now it's changing very quickly as was mentioned uh, before. But one concern that we did, I do have, and we did discuss uh, when we made the Latin American guidelines, is that I think that SGLT2s are very good drugs, are cardiovascularly um, effective in protecting against uh, uh, hospitalization for uh, heart failure, and also in, in secondary prevention, although cardiologists don't believe in dividing this like that. But I'm not sure that the evidence is really strong on primary prevention. That means that if everybody takes SGLT2s, then uh, cardiovascular disease will, will be, uh, the incidence will decrease uh, dramatically. Uh, this, this hasn't been fully proved. Uh, and my view is that they are very good, SGLT2s, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, failing heart, in the heart with uh, already with, with uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, um, diseased heart, uh, but not as, a, as they are not uh, good drugs for uh, preventing uh, the heart. Uh, on, uh, I mean, preventing coronary disease. And that's why I, I said that uh, we, we don't think that they should be used thinking that because of that, they will work like a statin, so to speak. So, Dr. Misra, when I went to medical school and during the last 20 years, I've heard that, you know, diabetes is a cardiovascular equivalent, like you will have a heart attack. So half of the people already have coronary heart disease or ischemic heart disease at diagnosis or shortly after that. So would that contradict with Dr. Ashner saying? Uh, would you consider drugs that are cardiovascular protective or effective from the beginning or do you have to wait until they have evidence, clinical evidence of having uh, cardiovascular disease or renal disease? See, uh, two things must be considered as far as the Indian population is concerned. One, that we have more higher magnitude of cardiovascular disease, and that starts early. And this has been very well shown by uh, Dr. Kanaya in the Masala study, that if you compare the white Caucasian versus the Indians, the coronary artery calcium score, especially in men, is twice amount higher than the Caucasian. So multiple studies have shown that Indians have a higher cardiovascular risk. So that is one. Number two. Indians have also have higher nephropathy risk. And this has been shown from University College of London by my colleague there, um, where the, the rate of decline of GFR was faster in Indian Asian, at least migrant Indians in uh, UK than, uh, than, than the whites there. Uh, there's higher amount of microlimuria, macroproteinuria, everything. So from th both point of view, I strongly believe that if we have economically, if patient is, is able to buy uh, SGLT2 inhibitor in Indian population, I would put SGLT2 inhibitor at the top and would certainly like to give SGLT2 inhibitor in most of the patient if money is not the problem. So Keaton. The ADA says to start dual combination when the hemoglobin A1C is about 1.5 above the, your desired level. The American College of Endocrinology would say anybody with hemoglobin A1C 7.5 and above should start. Now we have clinical trials that says even with hemoglobin A1C of 7, I think that's what Dr. Ashner is following, you should start combination therapy. What's the position of the UK guidelines? So there's no, there's no um, hard and fast rule about when to start. It just says when you, are, when you are first diagnosed, you start on metformin. And then if, depending on your risk category, you either, if you, if you don't have cardiovascular risk, then if you're not then at target just on metformin, then you add in PIO, DPP-4, SGLT-2, uh, or sulfonylurea. But if you are in that high risk category or have got established cardiovascular disease, then you would co-prescribe metformin and SGLT2 regardless of HbA1c. So even if you had an HbA1c of 6.7, uh, 
so you know, 40, uh, 50 millimoles per mole, 52 millimoles per mole, you would still be started on both agents. Because to me, I, I think that's probably right, because to me, you know, we know all of the data from, you know, the UK PDS and Accord and Advance, that good glycemic control right at the beginning of your diabetes life, if you achieve that for the first seven, 10 years of your diabetes life, it holds you in good stead for the rest of your diabetes, for the rest of your physical life. So to me, I don't think it makes much sense to say, okay, start on one drug, let you drift a little bit, and then we'll bring you down and let you drift a little bit when you have the option of hitting them hard and keeping them at well controlled for the first 10 years. So certainly many of my colleagues, I and many of my colleagues try to do that. It's more difficult in primary care where the vast majority of people are seen, because as Pablo said, you know, people are seen once a year maybe for 10 or 15 minutes and you know, you see a nurse and the, or a different nurse and your HbA1c rises, I'll oh, come back next year, it's a bit high. And you know, you go on holiday and you miss your appointment and it drifts up, okay, we'll try and bring it down now. And, You've lost that attempt. So uh, to me, being more aggressive right at the beginning and having a guidance that says, you know, use whatever agents you can is probably a good thing. The difficulty, of course, as we've all said, is the money. You know, there, and often we all live in society where there is no money to spend now to save later. But ideally, if in, if in an ideal world, we'd want to treat them aggressively right from the beginning. So let me open this. this the, this symposium for any comments or questions from the audience. Please. And while somebody comes to the microphone, they have to come to the microphone because if not, Keaton and Pablo will not be able, be able to hear. Uh, Keith, uh, Pablo, if there is any level, magic number of A1C that you use to start combination therapy or you start always from the beginning? Well, well the, the verified trial uh, show that uh, if you start from the beginning, um, the durability of the, uh, the treatment as far as uh, lowering blood glucose um, almost doubles. So, uh, and, and because of, the, of uh, the, the, the cost is almost the same, um, more and more uh, often we are starting with a combination regardless of the uh, uh, um, the level of HbA1c, as, as Keaton mentioned, also. Yes. Yeah, so, so Dr. Dr. Karnanidhi, we got your point. Uh, well, let, let's hold on, hold on. Hold on. Would you? Okay. Please, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, please take your seat. Please take your seat. Please, please take your seat. Uh, don't get excited, please. Please. Yeah. So. Uh, oh. oh. So sorry. I will bring you here. Pablo. You know what is what happened to Michael Lamb? I heard something about the Isle of Wight when uh, I was a registrar. That was my first fellow job in, on the Isle of Wight. That's where I worked. <laughs> about 20, no, no. 22, 23 years ago. You are threatening me. Yeah, more. I pay for the conference. Who paid you? Sit down. Okay. Uh, uh, Hello, hello, Dr. Kornanidhi. Don't be super excited. Please keep quiet. Ah, huh? Please. Every day he shouts at me. Dr. Singh, 
the actor saying, would you please? Yes, yeah. 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 Sit down. You sit down. Oh. Aniket. Aniket. Ah, who are you then? Look at him. Huh? This is how you conduct the seminar. I'm, I'm glad. You bring thugs. I'm glad, Kitchen and Pablo, you're not able to see. Oh, sorry. Just look at the front. Okay. Yeah, sorry for a little bit of interruption. So let's come to the point of whether starting with a single drug or a combination therapy. As Ketan was mentioning that today we have got the drug which, which has got a potential of causing hypoglycemia minimal. For example, starting with metformin or a GLT-2 combination. And when we have got a data at the moment that suggests that See, if you look at the current ACCHA guideline, 2022 guideline, the GLT-2 inhibitor has been given a grade one level of evidence A for even primary prevention. Of course, they have got a GLT-2 has got one A for the secondary prevention. Even for the primary prevention, it has got a one A, based on the declared TME data, which we all know. Now, we also learned over a year that combining a metformin to a GLT-2 inhibitor would likely have a chance of less genital tract infections compared to the monotherapy with a GLT-2 inhibitor. We do have some data with a GLT-2 DPP-4 that suggests that combination of these drugs might cause less genital tract infections compared to the, the GLT-2 therapy alone. But we also have now data that suggests metformin as GLT-2 may have a significantly less genital tract infection than a GLT-2 alone. So looking at all those figures, putting into the perspective that SGLT2 has got a primary prevention license of grade 1A because of the heart failure reduction, metformin SGLT2 would not potentiate hypoglycemia when you are starting as a combination therapy, perhaps may have a lesser GTI. Why not start with, and finally, in the Indian context, when we have got 100 pharmaceutical company uh, with Japagli uh, flows in, in a cost of, you know, um, hardly it will be, a, you know, five, uh, you know, uh, cents, five cents from the U.S. perspective. Why not one should go for the cost of metformin and SGLT2 is equal in India now. So now uh, I am proposing that from the Indian context, uh, see, there may be the issues for the cost in the United States or other part of the world. But here we have got a... A GLT2 that cause similar as of a sulfonylurea, similar as of a metformin. Why not we should now change the guideline given the current, you know, acquisition of the cheaper GLT2 inhibitor? So Dr. Sain, Dr. Sain is proposing metformin SGLT2. Dr. Ashner is proposing metformin DPP4. But I guess for primary prevention, dual combination should be the way to go early on in the disease. Would, that, would you agree? But where is the data for the DPP-4 inhibitor for any, any, any cardiovascular risk reduction? Forget about the primary prevention. We don't have data for the secondary prevention code for DPP-4. So uh, I totally agree with uh, what Dr. Singh has been saying. And this is exactly my contention also, that we are, uh, when we see the patient, they're already late, they're already at a high cardiovascular risk category. And we, if we have a combination which is cheap, why not use it? And it's just, uh, you know, fear of uh, unit tract infection and palindroposthate is so little and can be manageable. I think, I, I personally think for Indian population, we should revise our guidelines and put SGLT2 right up front and, and uh, we will, our patient will benefit definitely. Except a couple of things, you know, obviously a patient who's a BMI of 18, who's uh, having tuberculosis, who's having a lot of fever, catabolic state, we are not going to give it to them but appropriately cho choice patient, and we put metformin, SGLT2 inhibitor right up front. And most of them, uh, anyway, sir, uh, uncontrolled diabetes, 70% are uncontrolled. So your this thing of 1.5% is already fulfilled there. They have 8, 8.5, 9, 9, 10.5, 10, uh, hemoglobin A1C. So this fits very well as far as Indian population. Uh, Dr. Ashner. Uh, what about adverse events, side effects, with SGLT2 compared with DPP-4? Would that push you one way or the other? Um, <clears throat> well, first I would like to say that um, the option of metformin and SGLT2 is equally good. It will lower blood 
uh, glucose, uh, blood glucose uh, equally effectively. And uh, it might have also the additional benefit of some weight lowering. So I'm not against uh, starting with a combination of metformin and SGLT2, but I, I would not um, say that uh, regardless of HbA1c and regardless of what uh, is the effect on HbA1c, because that's what's happening. They, uh, particularly, uh, I would say, cardiologists think that if you give an SGLT2, the patient is now like uh, sort of protected against cardiovascular disease. And I don't think that is really, has been really demonstrated in primary prevention. Uh, patient still has to do a lot of work on, on uh, other cardiovascular risk factors. Now, going to the, to the uh, side effects, uh, you, in, in practice, you do see uh, frequently um, not urinary tract infection, but uh, uh, genital infection, particularly in women, uh, vaginal uh, uh, mycotic infection. That's not so rare, and it, uh, it's been triggered by the, by the use of SGLT2s, and we have to be careful about that. Can be treated, yes, but we have to be looking for that. On the other hand, with DPP-4 inhibitors, uh, there, there's hardly any side effects, and if there are, they are more attributable to metformin. But again, I'm, I would say that as long as the primary care physician know that he has, let's say, these two options, and he should start immediately with this combination using either DPP-4 or SGLT2, and then see how the patient does with that, uh, that would avoid uh, the inertia we are seeing now when you have to choose uh, whether the patient has renal disease or cardiovascular disease or, and try to look for that with uh, special exams and, you know, wait and wait, and uh, perhaps uh, losing focus on the fact that the patient needs uh, early uh, blood glucose control, as uh, Keaton was also mentioning. And, and talking about side effects, Keaton, you were the lead author for the UK guidelines on the management of diabetic ketoacidosis. Are you concerned about DK with the use of SGLT2s? Um, in people with type 1, yes, definitely. Uh, so we tend to avoid them. And in fact, the, uh, in the UK, AstraZeneca, the manufacturer of dapagliflozin, who uh, had the type 1 license, then withdrew the license. Now, they didn't say that was because of safety. It was because people weren't using it, because many, many specialty doctors were, were all just a bit afraid about the DKA risk. In people with type 2, I think the risk is significantly less. Although if you look at all the trials, um, you've still got anywhere between three and six fold increased risk of developing DK from a very low baseline, of course, but it does still increase the risk. So, you know, we, what we would tend to say is, uh, you know, as, we, as you would do for anybody, all of us, if you start somebody on a medication, you don't just give them a prescription and say, off you go. You counsel them, you say, you know, when you're on this medication, you need to watch out because some people get a genital yeast infection. If you do, you go and buy some ointment for it. But if you get, you know, if you become dehydrated, if you become ill with diarrhea or vomiting, if you're admitted into hospital, then just as you would stop metformin, just as you would stop your ACE inhibition, you'd need to stop these medications as well because of that increased risk. So I think we are all aware, but I think that with increasing education as particularly of primary care teams because they're the people who are going to do the vast majority of prescribing then the risk hopefully will be mitigated and if people are unwell you know you give them some comfort you make sure there's something else um, that they got on board you know, there are various risk mitigation strategies that have been published the other group of people of course who are at increased risk so we talked about using them very up, up front, and that's the time I think they would do best because beta cell reserve is at maximum. You've got lots of insulin around, and that would minimize the risk of developing DKA. If you leave it for a very long time, when, when beta cell reserve has gone down, these people have already got type 2 on insulin, 
that's the time that the, the risk will increase. So their blood glucose comes down, they reduce their dose of insulin, it crosses a threshold, you can't stop ketosis, and they become ill, their counter-regulatory hormones go up, and they develop DKA. So I think you've got to choose the people carefully and what stage of their diabetes journey they are at. I think it's better if they're used up front at the beginning of their diabetes journey because the risk of DKA then is a lot lower. We have another question from the audience. most indiscriminately because here people will be copying the prescriptions of consultants and they will not be knowing where exactly this drug is not to be used. So if they start using this patient, even in an insulinopenic patient, we are likely to come across many uh, euglycemic uh, ketoacidosis patients. Secondly, this drug is likely to increase gluconeogenesis and obviously it will give rise to more patients of sarcopenia and osteopenia. So unless we teach our patients also to have good protein and um, uh, calcium intake, and I think we, we will be expecting a lot more complications in future. Your comments, sir. Thank you. Uh, I, I'll, may I respond? Okay. Uh, number one question. Uh, we have been using this drug now for seven years, and uh, I remember initially when uh, uh, canaglifosin was introduced in India, we, within a short period of three months, we saw two diabetic uh, ketoidosis, non euglycemic ketoidosis. One was very severe, several, several days of hospitalization. But that, there's so many seminars, so many education, everybody knows about this particular entity in India. Most, maybe 10 to 15 percent of the people may not know, but still 90 percent, because everything is now available, seven years down the line, thousands of patients treated. As far as my practice is concerned, after that initial surge of diabetic ketosis, because somebody didn't know how to use it, subsequently people have been using quite judiciously, even in India, despite uh, uh, it is being available in every, every uh, you know, pharm pharma shop. And so we recently we have not seen, but the possibility is always there, as you rightly said, sir. Uh, number two, we showed in sarcopenia this thing that uh, use of dapagdoposin for 90 days did not res uh, reduce the muscle. And there are some uh, similar studies uh, worldwide also. So it's not always that these will produce sarcopenia unless patient is doing something very wrong. Not exercising, not enough protein, so they obviously they, they will go into sarcopenia. So sarcopenia is not a major question as far as this, this drug is concerned. Uh, but yes, inappropriate use still is in India. And you're right absolutely that we should educate our physicians more about uh, euglycemic ketosis and uh, the even genital myocardial infection. Yeah. And that is so, needed. So we have maybe a couple more minutes. So Kiran, you have been involved with these guidelines in the UK. And if you have to criticize your guidelines, or make, let's say, ask the question in a different way. If you would like to make a suggestion to the committee doing the guidelines in the UK for NICE or any other one, yes. what, would you, what would be your recommendation to improve the guidelines in your country? So I would say that, personally, I'd say for, for NICE that you need to rethink about the GLP-1 analogs. Because we deal with the, with the, the, the healthcare profession where pe the people don't have to pay for anything, it's the government that pays, I think that but I think the main thing that they missed out is the GLP-1 analogs, uh, where they come and the cardiovascular benefits. That's the one thing I would say they've missed. Hey, what about you, Pablo? If you would like to make a recommendation from your guidelines listening to these comments today, uh, what would you say? What would you suggest? Or do you think they are perfect enough that you don't need to move anything? No, no not at all. And uh, I think that uh, one thing we haven't discussed uh, obviously we don't have enough time to discuss is the issue about weight and I would emphasize really emphasize on, on, on the, uh, uh, trying to, that a patient will lose weight I think the, the worst inertia we are having is patients staying obese or overweight and doing nothing about the weight 
And in that case, um, GLP ones would be uh, the best options, particularly in those with BMIs above 30. So uh, we, I would emphasize on that, the use of uh, drugs that will help lowering weight. And uh, again, um, evidence proved uh, um, uh, GLP ones that can achieve uh, great uh, weight loss, including, I don't know if terzepatide will be too expensive, but that, that should be also included nowadays. And, and Dr. Misra, what would you recommend, for example, to the ADA? What needs to change on the ADA guidelines? You mentioned that's the one that people in India will follow most commonly. Uh, my thoughts I've already expressed. I, I think uh, we should make a GLT-2 inhibitor along with metformin as uh, the number one uh, you know, first-line drug, um, or metformin right up after that as GLT-2. Uh, but as GLT-2 should remain better place, retain a better place in the, in the algorithm. Uh, and that's, that would be our recommendation from India. Doc, Dr. Singh, would you, would you like to comment on this? Yes, sir, fully agree. Uh, I just have a comment on DKA. I just wanted to, but what the Ketan uh, started with, and I will just carry forward a little bit on that particular issue somehow. Uh, Professor Asner said that we had head-to-head -head trial of SGLT2 versus DPP4. There was no ounce of increase in UTI with SGLT2 compared to DPP4. The only difference was increased genital infection. So it's pretty clear that you know, the hype created around UTI with SGLT2 is not larger than what we found with DPP-4 inhibitor, number one. Number two, the initial DKA issue, remember when the, uh, you know, CANA was approved in, by USFDA in 12 and DEPA by EMA in 2013, we used to read paper in diabetes care, six case of DKA. And if you look back into those six cases, some had but, you know, surgery done, continuing on the tablet, someone has a binge alcohol, somebody didn't eat anything. Down the line, there was some cause associated to precipitate DKA. So somehow I feel that DKA, DKA part is a little bit overhyped. Why I'm saying, if you look into the trials, recent trials, for example, acute heart failure trial, impulse trial with IMPA, zero case recorded of DKA. DARE 19, only two cases of decay in the DARE 19 with defagliflozin. So somewhere we should be careful, we should be mindful about that. But somehow, uh, you know, decay issue is over, you know, hyped, over expressed. Even so, in the, in the trial, uh, yes. you know, the no, COVID, no increase in decay. With COVID 19, yeah. the defagliflozin was. Yeah, that's what I said, sir. DARE 19. Yeah, there is none. Don't Only two cases. Look like the doctor okay, Keaton, Keaton wanted to say something. The Terrier is yeah. getting a heart attack, so go ahead. Yeah, and the reason is, and I, I, I have to disagree with you. I, 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 I agree with the data that you know Dare has had two, Impulse has almost nobody. But the problem is, what you need to remember is that the big cardiovascular outcome studies went on for three, four years. Dare 19 went on for three months. So the actual follow and the sample size was pretty small compared to the thousands. So you could guarantee, even I could tell you, at, you know, before they did the trial, that the number of DKA events they would see would be zero or very small because their sample size and length of follow-up was not the same and therefore you cannot compare that data. So I have to disagree on that. Sorry, Ketan, I, I would argue on that. So let's look at the declare TME trial, the longest SGLT2 trials. There was no increase in DKA with defagliflozin in declare TME. Right? So at the mean okay. age, so mean duration of 4.2 years, you don't have an increased proportion. Yeah, there was a numerical increase, but it wasn't a statistically significant. So the diff okay, so th this is, we can talk about this offline, but I could talk about this for a long time. So you also have to think about how DK was diagnosed. Okay, what was the diagnostic criteria and were they what you would normally use DK to, to diagnose them with? And for some of these trials, they were not. And so, uh, okay, we, we, I, I don't think this is the time of the place to <laughs> talk about it. But, but, but are, in declared TV, so Ketan... Let me, Dr. Singh, you know, if we're going to... <laughs> I've been asked by the ADA to update the DK guidelines. And, of course, the previous one was done in 2009, so it's time to do it. And, and I do agree that it's a rare event, but there is no... I've seen... We have 19 cases at Emory, at my hospital, with DK in type 2s. That is usually, you're right, there's always a precipitating cause 
where people have been, bariatric surgery is the number one. We learn to stop the SCLT2 three or four days before, and mitigation has been suggested. So let me, we have another speaker from, two more from the United States coming up. No, one from the United States, uh, Amy Radberg, who is an expert in obesity, she is at the University of Michigan. And then we have exercise and diabetes by Dr. Napoli from Rome, who is an extreme guy. Hey, uh, I just wanted to say thank you for all of you to attending this session. Uh, Dr. Misra, thank you. And Kitan, Paolo, my buddies, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Alka. Come, I'll just make a comment. Because, because we are running, running short, short of time, time I, I will, will 